Hey, that. And, and, and what's crazy is that if you would have talked to me two years ago saying that I was going to, you know, baptize influential financiers for the kingdom and wealthy businessmen, I would laugh at your face and call you a Jesus freak. But yet here I am right now. And this is what I like to tell people. And I like to set this as a disclaimer because I really empathize with people who are very resistant to Jesus because I was like that too. You know, I grew up in the knowledge of the world, different philosophies, different schools of thought. Initially I was Islamic and I would tell people like, if it wasn't for the encounter that I had, which I'll get to soon, no one could have ever convinced me about Jesus. There's no amount of scripture that you could have quoted. There's no amount of prayer that you could have done that would have convinced me, okay, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I'd be like, all right, cool story, bro. Good for you. Uh, now go ahead and mind your own business. <laughs> right? Like, I don't, I'm just, just shooting you straight. Yeah. But when I had my encounter, there's no one who can talk me out of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray for everyone listening to this, whether you you are a new believer in Christ or whether you're kind of on the fence and you're tiptoeing because, you, you know, you don't necessarily believe every person that has been, you know, converted to Christianity or called themselves a Christian. Like I tell people today, I'm not, I've never converted to Christianity. I got transformed by Christ. Those are two different things. Yeah. And it's, it's like a Saul to Paul thing. Like Saul was a persecutor and he would kill every person who believed in Christ. <laughs> now he, he wrote 17 books of the New Testament. We wouldn't have the New Testament if it wasn't for Paul, right? So anyway, going back to your question, um, I was born in Mecca, Saudi Arabia to a Muslim Syrian father and a Buddhist Thai mother. Uh, and my biological mother, she converted to Islam for my dad. Um, and she was 10 years older than my dad. My dad had me when he was 20. She was in her 30s. And, um, and it was one of those things where they got married in the largest Islamic center in Bangkok, Thailand, and then they moved out to Saudi Arabia. They had me, but their relationship, there was, <laughs> there might be some chemistry, but there was no compatibility and they sure, it sure did not have the best communication, right? Because he spoke Arabic as his first language. He spoke Thai and they kind of spoke broken English, right? So it was like body language. That's the only, <laughs> that's the physical attraction of body language is how they got together. So they split up a few months after I was born and um, I grew up not knowing who my birth mother was. And my dad told me, wow. you know, his version of the story of what happened between um, my mom and him. And basically his side was that she didn't want me. She had another family and she left and she never came back. That's what his side was of the story was. Um, and then my dad got married a couple of times. His, he got his second marriage right after. So he bounced back and had a baby with that lady and then divorced and then had another marriage. So um, his third wife was a U.S. citizen, but she was raised in Iraq. And she fell head over heels for my dad. And so she told my dad, hey, let me take care of your son and raise him in the United States while you go out and you, you build your business and your empire, right? And so I came to the United States, specifically Patterson, New Jersey, um, grew up there when I was five years old and I was raised by an Iraqi family. And so I had no connection to my Asian roots, my Thai roots, but I was raised by a bunch of Arabs. But I look like, if you look at me, I, you know, people get confused. They either think I'm Spanish, I'm Polynesian, I'm some form of Asian persuasion or something. So they can't necessarily peg me. So I tell people I'm like the United Nations in one body, right? So I grew up with my stepmom raising me. I call her my mom today. And then my dad came into the picture, came back into the picture when I was 11. Between five to 11, my dad was building his empire in the Middle East. My dad is a very, very, very wealthy businessman. I don't talk much about him because he's a private guy um, and, and that's by design. <laughs> and, um, and even though he was very financially successful, he was emotionally bankrupt. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's certain people in the business world, I'm sure you know a bunch of people who achieve success at the expense or at the sacrifice of the ones that they love. I don't think my dad meant to do it, but that's how it ended up happening. So in the process of building his success, he was trying to groom me to inherit all the family businesses and the wealth and the assets. So most people don't know, and I don't really share this with a lot of people, it's like I was supposed to be a trust fund baby. 
my father was a first generation wealth creator and I was supposed to be the, the inheritor, the next in line. So during my teen years, he was teaching me all about asset protection. He would say like the name of the game is not to have anything under your name, you know, to own, own nothing, control everything. And I was like, what are you talking about? But I was like reading books in international commerce and he would just prepare me to understand how business operates, like the whole nine. And it got to a point when I was um, 18 years old, he basically gave me the keys to his kingdom, his empire. And he said, hey, you know, I want you to manage the family business. You're the oldest of eight brothers and sisters. You're supposed to take care and, and teach them. And I said, I said, Baba, that's, um, I, I hear you, but that's just a lot of pressure. And I don't want to make you disappointed or, or not make you proud. And, you know, at, at that point in time, all I wanted to do as a son was make my dad proud. And I didn't want to lose whatever I had left with him in a relationship. So I started pretending to be someone that I wasn't as a coping mechanism and as a survival instinct, just wow. so that he could be proud of me. And one of the areas where I hid from him during my teen years was in the area of like my intimate relationship with my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and my relationship with spirituality. And so when I was 14, just to backtrack a little bit, when I was 14, 15 years old, um, I was an early bloomer because my father got married 12 different times with 12 different women over the span of my lifetime. And, um, oh. and I, don't, I, don't, I don't share that to like throw them under the bus is, uh, you know, it, <laughs> it just sounds so bad. <laughs> But listen, different culture, different time, you know. But, different... but also recognize like people didn't have YouTube podcasts. They didn't have great yeah, mentors. You didn't have, <laughs> like, you don't have any of that. Like my, my dad claimed bankruptcy 2009, but like yeah, he couldn't yeah. just pay someone for consulting or like find info on YouTube to like figure right. things out, you know, it's a whole different so game. My, my dad taught me something early on in my teen and I didn't understand. You, know, you ever have like one of those lessons from like a mentor or a father figure? They say something at an early age and you don't understand. You just nod your head. And then 10 years, 20 years later, you're like, ah, that's what, that's what he meant. So yeah. one thing my dad, I realized about my dad, he had eight kids, 12 marriages with 12 different women. Each divorce ended worse than the last, but he never paid child support, but he always supported his children if they wanted it. And he taught me early on, there's no difference between business and marriage, legally speaking. Legally speaking, there's no difference. The only reason why he didn't pay child support is because he didn't take his private affairs and marry it into the public world or the state. And, and so like early on, he was like, like my dad, my dad was deep. It was just in a different direction. Like, even, so I was just like, oh, okay, that's what he meant but he just had the wrong tools or the wrong mindset to go about it. So 